You know what I need more of in my life? Refrigerant gas. And one of the most important gases in my quest for homemade liquid nitrogen is ethylene. This video is sponsored by Squarespace. More on that later. In a video I made a few months ago, I showed how to make ethylene, also known as ethene, which is C2H4. This is a really important substance because it can be used as a refrigerant gas both for cascade vapor compression systems or for mixed gas Joule Thompson cryocoolers. It's also used to make plastic or something like that, but it's just really obscure chemistry that probably doesn't affect your daily life, so who cares. My process for making it worked, but it was pretty crude, required burning fuel, required constant monitoring, and it didn't produce a very consistent result. In this video, I'm going to improve that process by automating it. Automation is everywhere nowadays. Manufacturing? Automated. Car driving? Automated. A reply from my health insurance provider telling me to go f*** myself? Automated. So by God, my ethylene production is going to be automated too, and I won't rest until my suburban baby boomer HOA neighborhood looks a little more productive. Okay, quick recap from last time. Ethylene is made when ethanol is boiled, then the vapor contacts a hot aluminum oxide catalyst somewhere around 400 to 450 degrees C. This breaks up the ethanol molecule into water and ethylene. The water separates out in a liquid trap, and bam, you've got ethylene gas. My original design involved a resistor and a capped flask to boil ethanol into vapor and a catalyst pipe over a manually controlled propane burner which had its output connected to a beach ball to collect the gas. And it did work, but it kind of sucked. So here's how I'm going to automate the whole process. First off, I'm going to ditch the propane burner and heat my catalyst pipe with these electric band heater things meant for injection molding machines. To control the temperature, the heaters will be wired through a solid state relay which can be driven with a PWM signal from an Arduino board. Feedback for the temperature control will come from a thermocouple that's stuck right in the middle of the catalyst pipe. The heater will also have a mechanical relay upstream of the solid state one as a safety shutoff in case the solid state relay fails shorted. I'm going to keep using the resistors with 120 volts to boil the alcohol like before, but instead of using a glass flask, I'll use a stainless steel bottle with a screw-on lid and a gasket, and at least one liter of capacity so I can run the whole process for most of the day. The boiler will have two heater settings, 100 watts and 30 watts. The 100 watt jump starts the boiling process, but might provide too much ethanol vapor for the catalyst to process, so once the liquid gets up to a boil, it's shut off, and the 30 watt heater takes over. These heaters will be turned on and off by relays, which are also controlled by the Arduino board. When the ethanol runs out but the heaters are still on, the temperature inside the boiler will start to go above the boiling point of the ethanol, which will be detected by a thermistor inside the bottle. When an over-temperature event is detected, the board will shut off power to the boiler heaters. Water, ether, or unreacted ethanol will collect in a liquid trap, and the gas will fill a big half-liter syringe. When the syringe is full, it hits a limit switch that will turn on a relay to the compressor that'll pump the ethylene into a holding tank. And that's pretty much it. Now let's build it. I'll start by squishing the end of a 1 and 3 8 by 24 inch long aluminum pipe so that I can braze a feed tube onto it. Turns out brazing aluminum is way harder than brazing copper. That was a total disaster. Let's try it again, but this time with some flux. Actually, a lot of flux. That's pretty ugly, but I think I got it. It's holding a column of water right now, so it seems to be sealed. Also, I'll have to trim down that feed tube. And now I'll just fill the open end with aluminum oxide beads. I'm going to reuse the aftercooler coil from my previous ethylene generator and braze it on the same way I brazed on the feed tube. I definitely need more practice doing this because it's way, way harder than brazing copper or brass. Still super ugly, but seemed to seal when I put a few psi of pressure on it, which is all I really need. Here's one of the band heaters. It's a 35mm inner diameter, so it fits almost perfectly over the 1 and 3 8 inch pipe. The clamp keeps it pressed tight against the pipe wall to maximize heat transfer. I'm going to add 7 more for a total of 8. Each one can provide up to 135 watts, so just over a kilowatt total. They look pretty good, too. The reason I've left the ends uncovered is so that they don't reach the full 400 to 450 C temperature of the reaction because that will start to melt off the aluminum brazing alloy. Next, a basic drinking water bottle for the boiler. The cap is drilled for wire pass-throughs and a barb fitting. I stick the thermistor in first and then run the wires for 120 volt heaters. I'll seal everything up with this high temperature silicone. Probably overkill since the ethanol only boils at 78 C. Now while we're waiting for that silicone to dry, let me tell you about today's sponsor, Squarespace. If you need a website for your business but you don't want to just put it under the umbrella of a social media platform run by lizard people or have it look like it was made by a 12 year old in 1998, Squarespace solves both of those problems and then some. Squarespace offers website hosting and all the tools you'd need to build and run a business website. They provide graphic design tools that help you make a professional looking site and make it super easy to set up invoicing, payment processing, and appointment scheduling. You can also use it to run ads for your business on social media sites, and it provides all the important analytics for website traffic and sales data, as well as inventory and shipping management, and all the other businessy stuff that CEO type people do. 
Go to squarespace.com for a free trial, and if you want to launch a website, go to squarespace.com slash hyperspacepirate to save 10% on your first purchase of a website or domain. Oh look, our silicone is dry now. Once again, pretty ugly, but when I tested it with some pressure, it seemed like it was making a good seal. Next, I'll solder up the heater resistors. The big ones are 500 ohms wired in parallel, and the smaller one is 1 kilo ohm for the sustainer. The little one would only provide 15 watts on 120 volts, so I later replaced it with another 500 ohm resistor to provide 30 watts instead. The pack is tied up and just barely fits through the mouth of the bottle. Next comes the control board. At its core is an Arduino Nano, but there's a few more parts it needs to make it all work. 12 volts from a wall adapter powers an LM7805, which provides 5 volts to power the Arduino board and LCD display. The Arduino reads the boiler thermistor through an analog channel and the catalyst thermocouple through an SPI bus. A potentiometer is used to set the target temperature, a push switch is read to determine when to start the program, and a 3D printer limit switch is read from the gas syringe. To control the boiler heater, compressor, and heater safety shutoff relay, a 5 volt signal from the Arduino turns on and off MOSFETs that trigger the mechanical relays. To control the catalyst heater, a smaller BJT is controlled by a PWM signal from the Arduino, which in turn drives the input of a solid state relay that switches the heaters on and off at a higher frequency to precisely control the power. All of the mechanical relays also have manual overrides with toggle switches. And finally, a 20x4 LCD is driven over the I2C bus to read out temperature and runtime data. All those electronics live on a 3D printed tray. This is the Arduino, the board, 12 volt supply, mechanical relays, and solid state relay. On top of the relays, this little deck will provide a surface for some screw terminals to sit on top to wire all the power connections together. Here's what the front panel will look like. The LCD display is on top, and on the bottom are the manual override switches, temperature adjustment knob, and the start button. It all live inside this control box that will be attached to the fixture. Then I go through the tedious task of writing code for the whole thing. This took a few iterations to get right. If you're interested in recreating this project, I've provided a link to the Arduino code in the video description. Now I need a frame to mount the catalyst pipe on. My previous design used a horizontal pipe, but that took up a lot of floor space, so I'm going to make the new one vertical. Plus, it'll give that cozy refinery look that everyone loves. I threw together some 20mm slotted railing to make the frame, then secured the catalyst pipe to it with some sheet metal pipe clamps. The thermocouple sits outside the pipe because I didn't have enough wall thickness to thread it in and get a good seal. The first time I tested the heater, a bunch of water started steaming out of the piping. I'm guessing this is atmospheric moisture that was trapped by the aluminum oxide during manufacturing or shipping. I added ceramic wool around the catalyst pipe to keep the heat in, then wrapped it with foil. The foil reflects back some heat, but it's mostly there just to keep those pesky asbestos fibers from floating off into the air. I did the same thing for the feed tube and the boiler, so there shouldn't be too much heat loss now. Next, I placed the vertical frame with the catalyst pipe on a wooden board and secured it with some 3D printed brackets for the feet. Heat transfer through the frame is actually really low, so I can use 3D printed brackets on it even though the pipe is close to 500C. This is the syringe that will serve as the gas piston to trigger the compressor. It's 500ml, which is the biggest one I could find. It mounts to the vertical frame with some 3D printed hoops. I also made this bracket for a 100mm 12 volt fan, which will blow on the aftercooler to help condense any volatile liquids coming over. If everything works right, it should only be water vapor getting condensed though. Then I made this mount for some limit switches for the syringe. There's two of them wired in parallel, just for redundancy I guess. This mount sits above the syringe piston so that when it's close to full extension the switches trigger, sending a command signal to turn on the compressor. The control box will sit at the front of the fixture with all the wiring at the back. The gas output hose has an adapter for a quarter inch NPT flare so that it can connect right up to my transfer compressor. The hose is joined to a T-barb fitting that will be plumbed to the syringe and the liquid trap output. The liquid trap is just a pasta jar I cleaned out, added some copper tubing to, and sealed up. I think it holds around 400 ml, which should be enough if an entire liter of ethanol is dehydrated. The trap sits in a printed bracket and is connected to the aftercooler output and the junction between the syringe and the gas output hose. I added a few other widgets just for convenience. There's this clamp for the 120 volt cable, this zip tie holder thing for the gas output hose, and this hook at the top of the vertical frame that I can hang the gas hose and power cable from just to keep things organized. This funky looking adapter provides mains power to the compressor when it gets the turn on signal, so it doesn't need to be plugged into a separate outlet, it comes straight from my fixture. And I added this USB extender because I didn't plan ahead and I couldn't really access the USB on the Arduino board once everything was in place. This is really helpful for when I need to change the code on the board. So here's the whole assembly ready to go. 
At first I used denatured alcohol from the hardware store, but then I noticed it was boiling at a suspiciously low temperature. With the heater at 100 watts and the alcohol bubbling like crazy, I was only reading 71C, but ethanol boils at 78.4C. When I looked up the MSDS of this particular brand of denatured alcohol, I found the problem. This stuff is up to 60% methanol. That explains the lower temperature, since methanol has a boiling point of 64.7C, so mixing it 50-50 with ethanol would be right around 71C. Now methanol does still create ethylene in this reactor, but the process is a little weirder because it breaks up into CH2 and water, so the CH2 ions usually combine with each other to make ethylene, but it can also form bigger chains and make propylene, butylene, pentene, and so forth, which I don't want. These CH2 chains are called alkenes. Anyway, I swapped the hardware store alcohol for bioethanol, which claims to be 96% ethanol and doesn't have any weird or smelly additives. After this, I started getting consistent ethylene production. To start the generator, you just plug in power, set the temperature with this knob, and hold the start button for one second. The display reads out catalyst temperature, boiler temperature, and time elapsed since starting. While that's all warming up, I'll go ahead and plug in the compressor and connect up the hoses to the generator and the holding tank. Here's a look at the whole system with the compressor and tank attached. Of course later this will be on a small table with the tank and compressor underneath so it will hardly take up any space in my garage. Once we start to see dripping into the liquid trap that means the reaction is happening and gas is being produced. Here's a time lapse of the syringe moving up and down as ethylene is generated and then pumped into the tank. We start off at 0 psi on the tank and after about 3 hours it's up to 40 psi which works out to around 103 liters based on the size of the tank. So there you have it. No need to monitor or babysit the generator, it's pretty much a completely automated mini chemical plant. You just load the alcohol and press go. After a full day of running starting in the morning before work, I collected a little over 300 liters of ethylene, which is way more than I need, but certainly doesn't hurt to have. And as usual, just to show you that I actually made this special cold juice, here's a discharge of liquid ethylene from my cryocooler's pre-cooler reaching that chilly minus 100 degrees. I actually collected enough that I can pour it out into a shot glass. The thermocouple reads higher than the minus 104 boiling point, but it might be because I'm pressing against the walls of the glass, which are a lot warmer. And here's an even bigger batch. Pro tip, don't pour cryofluid too fast or it'll boil up and overflow like mine did. And here's an important reminder that while ethylene allows us to reach extremely cold temperatures, it's still an extremely flammable gas and even more flammable as it's boiling off in its liquid state. This poor beaker went from minus 100 C to hundreds or thousands of degrees in a matter of minutes. I'm pretty surprised it didn't shatter. In my next video, I'll be using this as a second stage refrigerant for a hugely improved new cascade vapor compression system. Thanks for watching, and I'll catch you in the next video.